Good evening, everybody. I've been studying nitrogen fixation not quite as long as, uh, as Tom Bissling has, but <coughs> since, uh, since around 1982. And when I listen to talks about nitrogen fixation and that process of interaction between the bacteria and the plant, I'm always absolutely astounded yeah? that some symbiosis like that can evolve in which, with that fine control between the bacteria and the plant. Absolutely fantastic. I chose as the title for this evening, I don't have it on the slide, but a, a title, When Technology Escapes the Laboratory. Yeah? So Tom's been talking about looking at the technology, uh, looking at uh, the symbiosis really at that very, vi very fine scale. What I want to do is then to talk about what happens when we look at that technology in the field, when we look at nitrogen fixation in practice, and I want to tell you something about the excitement of what we're doing in Africa in particular. So here's our logo. You see there the triple bond of, of nitrogen. Oh, Mario. The project activities started at the beginning of 2010. Everything's in place and we're really going full speed ahead. We've been tapping on expertise from all around the world to make sure that we get the very best technologies here in Africa for African farmers. So it's quite easy to demonstrate the process of nitrogen fixation in, in a glasshouse. Here we've got plants of groundnut, peanut, which have got the effective rhizobium, and there are the yellow ones. They're deficient in nitrogen, they don't have the rhizobium. It's much harder to do this actually in the field. This is an experiment from early work we were doing actually in northeast Thailand earlier, where we're comparing genotypes in the field, ones which are able to form nodules, one, ones which are unable to form nodules. And these were actually genotypes selected by breeders during their normal breeding process in the field, and they came across these funny yellow plants, and they, they, so they selected them and propagated them, and they found that they couldn't form nodules. And interestingly enough, groundnut has a slightly different infection process than the one that Tom described for uh, Medicargo and others. It's, it's what we call a crack entry, so the bacteria find their way in through cracks, but those cracks only form at the axils of roots, so where roots are, are branching out. And in groundnut, it only has root hairs at those axils of the roots. And I always say, it's a bit of a funny analogy, but they're like sort of hairy armpits, yeah? They have these root hairs there. Well, these genotypes have lost those, they don't have hairy armpits, they have very clean armpits. And that means that they actually can't form nodules, yeah? Now, okay, that's not much use for the farmer, of course, having these plants that can't fix nitrogen. But it's great for us as scientists because it means we can grow them out in the field these plants are, uh, are dependent on nitrogen from the soil, whereas these ones are able to fix nitrogen, so we can get a measure of how much nitrogen is being fixed. And those are really very substantial amounts. In a groundnut crop, we can get as much as 200 kilograms of nitrogen fixed in a season. If we look below ground, of course, here's the root system covered in nodules. Here are the, the groundnuts. I mean, for those who don't know, Groundnuts are formed below the ground, which is why it's called groundnut. But it also has this wonderful feature of these gynophores, these pegs that grow from the flowers. They penetrate into the soil, and then the, the, the pods are formed below the ground. So groundnut's one of the crops that we work with. But it's against a backdrop of this problem, a problem of soil fertility. You can see this soil here in the front. It's a white, sandy soil. 
It's incredibly poor in nutrients. It's virtually devoid of nitrogen. So it's a real problem for crop growth. We can't grow crops in this because there's no nitrogen there. Farmers generally in Africa have got very limited access to nitrogen fertilizers. In this case, you can see some good crops of maize close to the house, but that's where the cattle manure is being used to enrich the soil. Now, it was actually when I was giving a talk about this problem, and I was talking about these wonderful solutions. So we've got different types of legumes. We've got the groundnut here. We've got legume green manures. We've got tree legumes. This is cespania. That's just one year old. We've got about 500 kilograms of nitrogen fixed in that one year of cespania growth. Uh, down at the bottom, that's stylosanthes, a legume forage plant uh, growing in Madagascar. So I was talking about these wonderful plants at a conference in Tanzania, and a young lady came up to me at the end and said, oh, Ken, do you remember me? And I said, well, um, actually, your face is familiar, but I'm not quite sure. And it turned out it was a lady called Yvonne Pinto. Uh, she was working for the Gates Foundation. And she said, well, Ken, you, you really must come and, and talk to us. I'd been talking to her in a class about nitrogen fixation when she'd done her master's 10 years before. So it just shows that teaching students sometimes pays you back, yeah? <laughs> um, we went out to dinner that night. She said, well, what can you do for us in the Gates Foundation in terms of bringing nitrogen fixation into the fields of farmers? And so from that point, we actually then went on to develop uh, a large project. So we've got these wonderful potential solutions, but when we take them out onto smallholder fields, and here we've got one of those really very poor soils, actually, the plants don't grow properly. They don't grow properly because there's not enough phosphorus and potassium and other nutrients there. There's no organic matter there. And generally, the soils are pretty devoid of bacteria, and they can't find the right, the right rhizobia there to be able to grow. And this shows that although we have these wonderful solutions, well, there are no silver bullets. Things don't work everywhere. And this is really what I want to focus on today as we talk about these, these different plants. Because how do we actually make this work for farmers who have limited resources? Now, we have all of these different solutions, but what we've found over the years, and I'll skip through here an awful lot of research in a lot of places, is that these plants which grow beautifully but just to enrich the soil, and not generally what farmers want. We found time and time again when we put these things alongside each other, we ask farmers, right, what do you want? You have forages, the tree fallows, the green manures. They say, no, we want a grain legume. We want something we can eat now or we can, we, we, we can sell at the market. We, we have an immediate need. We can't wait until next season because we've got to feed our children now. So all of our work in the last uh, eight years working with Enter Africa is focused on grain legumes. So very quickly to describe the project, we lead it from Wageningen here, but with many, many partners in Africa. We're working with partners in 11 different countries. These dark green countries are the main focus of where we are, uh, but in 11 countries from West, East and Southern Africa, uh, we had a first phase which we said was a proof of concept. Could we really make this technology work at scale for farmers in Africa? And now in the second phase, we're really looking at how we institutionalize these approaches and that we can scale them up. Now, I call Into Africa what, a development to research project. You know, we all know about research for development. You know, we start in the laboratory and then we work through and we deliver something. We were actually charged by the foundation, by the Gates Foundation, well, what can you do now? Yeah? So we said, well, what we're going to do is we take out the very best technologies. So we have in the center there what we call delivery and dissemination. We take out the best technologies into farmers' fields. We then have this monitoring and evaluation shell around that. So we try and understand what's working where and why and for whom. So our research really becomes an understanding of how the technology is performing in different places, and then we have these feedback loops which are coming from dissemination through the monitoring evaluation where when we find out that things aren't working, we go back to the, the, the drawing board, we look at improving the technology so that we can develop continuously new technologies. We like to talk 
of a technology pipeline. Yeah? We've got to have things coming out of the pipeline which are delivered to the farmers' fields, but that pipeline needs to be filled from the other end with new varieties, with new rhizobia coming in so that in future years we can be improving on what we're doing now. So we see this then very much as an iterative process. And then when we get to the field, we've talked about the genotype of the legume, and that interacts with the genotype of the rhizobium to form the symbiosis. But for that to perform well in the field, it's got to be adapted to the environment. So there we're talking about the climate and the soils. So the, the nitrogen-fixing legume has to fit well to the climate. And then we've got management. It's got to be managed well, sown at the right time, at the right density. It's got to be weeded well, etc., to actually be able to express that wonderful nitrogen-fixing phenotype. So I've got some examples for you here of wh what we're doing. So they're new varieties. So this is a new variety of cowpea in West Africa. It's early maturing, which means it produces a, a, a grain early in the season when people are often very hungry, has large white seeds, good yields, if we can crawl the insects pests, and we see spontaneous diffusion among farmers. So here's a farmer in, sorry, in Mali who's basically planted that large field with this new variety. He's taken it from the demonstration plots, he's moved it on. Here's another farmer with a beautiful large field of this variety, very popular with farmers. Now, in these soils which aren't too infertile, that's all we need, a new seed, because these cowpea can find the right rhizobia in the soil. Cowpea actually have a whole, um, are, are actually able to recognize a wide range of different bacteria. They're what we call a promiscuous legume. Yeah? I think people have a concept of what promiscuity means. It often means something slightly different when we're talking about people, but you, you get the idea. So these are, uh, this is a legume which can form nodules with many, many different types of bacteria. It has actually, uh, can recognize many, many different types of nod factor. So that's cowpea. But then when we move on to other legumes, and particularly soya bean, then we need to inoculate. We need to introduce the bacteria for this legume because that is a more specific legume. It can't nodulate with bacteria present in the soil. So we have these different products. This is the, another one, Nodumax. So biofix, legume fix, different commercial products which are basically in the bacteria on a carrier. Here's a demonstration of them being applied in the field. So these people are demonstrating how they're used. So you basically have a bucket with some seed in it. We open the packet. We put the uh, peat-based inoculum on top. We shape the bucket very gently so as not to damage the seed. The seed's then covered in the bacteria. That can be planted in the soil, and it carries the bacterium with it. It's as simple as that. It's a technology that's actually been around for well over 100 years. It was first introduced as an inoculant technology in the very early 1900s in the United States. And when it works, it works brilliantly. Here we've got an example in the farmer's right hand. We have a, the, the plant from the control plot. You can see very tiny plant looking very yellow, looking growing very poorly in his left hand, and it's the same number of plants, I assure you, a beautiful, prolific growth, all based on the fixation of atmospheric nitrogen. But it's not always so good. We go into another field. This is up in, in northern, uh, northern Nigeria. We walk into the field. There's all this space between the plants. We look, oh, look, it's been weeded late. These plants are growing badly. It's, it's not been looked after properly. And then we point over, yeah, but what about that plant? And then the farmer goes to stand by it. We, we zoom in a bit, and you see that that plant's actually growing beautifully. So there's one plant in the field that's doing well, and the rest are really poor. And what can that be due to? Well, this is the lucky plant. This plant had a gift from a cow that was passing by in the previous season and left a little drop of manure there, which gave it enough nutrients for it to be able to grow. And we take this back, we have lots of master's students here in, in, uh, in Wageningen, so we, Samson went out to work in northern Nigeria in the glasshouse doing these missing nutrient trials where he's looking then 
with a whole range of different treatments, a complete nutrient solution, uh, without micronutrients, without P, without K, etc. All different treatments. And what do we find? These soils are really, really in a bad shape. We're missing magnesium, the phosphorus is, is missing, there are micronutrient problems, and even in the control, we have some toxicity symptoms. So the soils are very poor, they're very old soils, they're very exhausted soils, and basically they need a different type of amendment, a different type of fertilizer. And we've been able to work with fertilizer companies in a range of different countries now to actually put new products on the market which don't just have phosphorus in them, they have phosphorus and calcium and magnesium and micronutrients which can really address these other nutritional needs of the plant so that we can get plants to grow well. We're also a bit involved in research on rhizobium. This slide doesn't really fit in with my story too well, but it's just such a beautiful slide. I just had to show it to you. Because these are different uh, they're strains of rhizobium which are marked with different genetic markers which just express a nice colour when they're exposed to different substrates. And that allows us then to study the interaction between uh, rhizobia to how they compete with each other to get into the nodule. Beautiful pictures and uh, George and Wender actually just received his, his PhD uh, a few weeks ago as the, the, uh, the second, I think, uh, Enter Africa PhD to finish. I want to move on though to look at another legume and that's the bean, Phaseolus. Between two fields of climbing beans in northern Rwanda. Beans were introduced into Africa in the 16th century from Latin America, from South America, along with maize, and they've travelled together through Africa ever since. What you see here now, though, these climbing beans, were actually only found in a very few pockets in northern Rwanda and in DRC, but in the very highlands. Here we are around 2,000, 2,300 metres above sea level. We're very high up. That means that it's a cooler climate and these beans actually take much longer to grow and develop than the bush beans. If we go back to the 1970s, what you'd have found here is 90% or more of the landscape would be covered with the bush beans, the, the short beans, and just a very, very few fields of climbing beans. So again, this is a lovely example of where genotypes of beans have been taken from Latin America. They've been bred to be locally adapted in Africa. And when we plant them out for farmers in densely populated areas with very small areas of land, it allows them to intensify vertically. Yeah? But again, we find that if these climbing beans don't have uh, cattle manure or something to provide nutrients, their growth is very poor. On the right here, this is uh, Mrs. Gasilida, and this, is this variety is actually uh, named after her. And she's standing there in these climbing beans, and I walk into that field, and I'm, I'm there, and all these beans are there above my head. They're about three metres above the ground. And if you've got a small plot of land, of course, it's a wonderful way to intensify, intensifying vertically. It's not without its problems, because you need stakes and the like to prop these up. And this is just with manure and phosphorus added, but we're finding increasingly now that beans also benefit from inoculation. And uh, Edward Ruranga, who's here in the room somewhere, has actually demonstrated this very clearly with the climbing beans, that they do respond to inoculation. The benefits of these beans as well then, if you look at that luxurious biomass, is that then we then grow a crop afterwards. So here on, on the right side, well, your left side, my right side of the screen, Maze after maize, very poor growth. Here's maize following climbing bean. And you can see that the beans leave a lot of nitrogen behind in the soil, which obviously helps for the next crop as well. So we've got lots of examples of where this works. We've been working now over the time, and this is now the second phase of the project from 2014 to 2018. And this is actually in, uh, in thousands of farmers we've actually managed against the target we had of half a million to reach over 600,000 farmers across these 11 countries. Now we do that in different ways, particularly through demonstrations in the field, but also field days and the like. 
and we're working particularly now through other partners. So we have retreated back, if you like, to having done this proof of concept to our, our uh, role as a knowledge provider up there at the top. We're working with different companies, a seed company, with smallholder cooperatives, with national research institutes. Uh, and in the centre, this barley green is a commercial farmer in Ethiopia who actually has a whole number of outgrows. He has 23,000 smallholder farmers growing a large seeded uh, chickpea. I've got some pictures of those. So here we are in the field on a demonstration day with our colleagues from the Gates Foundation. You see this is a variety of very large confectionery chickpea. It's got a very good market. The farmers are then growing this, able to sell it into the market and, and able to also get a lot of fixed nitrogen into their soil. So through working through these partnerships, we can reach many different people. And again, we've now got commercial inoculants for sale in Ethiopia for chickpea, which weren't there uh, a couple of years ago. We've been through the whole strain selection testing on large scale and been able to demonstrate that these work. We're actually doing, I think, some very interesting work looking at host cultivar rhizobium specificity within the genus uh, chickpea at the moment. We also work through pharma groups in Uganda. We partner with World Vision. This is from uh, August last year when I was there. Very strong gender focus, so a women's group. They're in their wonderful, colourful uniform in the field, uh, helping to build capacity, collective marketing, looking at ways of diversifying their farming systems. We even have some extremely young farmers here in their, their uniform, presented me in the field with this cockerel as a gift. I couldn't bring back on the plane with me, actually, but anyway. Uh, last week, I was in Malawi, dealing with groundnuts there, new varieties of groundnut. They're resistant to rosette virus, one of the biggest threats for groundnut production. And here, if you look at the front, this is the typical farmer's way of planting, really too sparse. It actually opens up the canopy for lots of disease and pest attack. In the back, it's a double row planting, very, very simple technology. Just simply changing the density of planting, you can actually get almost double the yield. So we do a lot of work around that as well, simple technology. And then here's soybean in Malawi, again from last week. A new variety, this Ticolori, it's uh, rust tolerant, large seeded, and a new local inoculant that's been on the market for two years, the local producer who's, who's making this inoculant, very proud. Uh, selling it there. Last season, I think he sold 200,000 packets of this. It's not the best quality in the world. We know that. It's a very simple technology. It can be improved, but it's a great start, and it, and it works. So, last couple of examples. In terms of improving, improving self-sufficiency of food, some farmers we're working with really don't have a large area of farms. They really need to try and intensify on them. This is in DRC. This is the farmers with the livestock they have. They're incredibly poor areas where they actually grow guinea pigs. As, uh, they're fantastic uh, livestock because they reproduce very fast. They're easy to harvest. Yeah, if you want just a small uh, joint of meat, it's hard to cut the leg off a goat. But if you've got guinea pigs, you can harvest them one by one. They also produce manure. They're kept in the house in small corners. And that manure, if it's put in the pocket at planting in the back there, just one teaspoonful, you can actually increase yield from about half a ton to one ton. It's not a fantastic yield, but that can be a difference of a month's food cell sufficiency for a family. So we, even though these are small incremental changes, we shouldn't dismiss them. I already mentioned this uh, short duration cowpea in, in West Africa. These two farmers actually, these two lady farmers were early adopters. They actually started growing the seed and selling it as a product to other farmers in the village. So they were using that as a way of making money. But of course, the legumes also provide energy, protein, minerals, and, and vitamins. And within N2 Africa, we won this prize actually for scaling up nutritional benefits for women. And this was working particularly simply by focusing the dissemination to women rather than men in the community. We find if we focus on the men, the men basically take the crop to market and that earns money and it rarely goes back into the household food basket. 
If the women are in control of the crops, and legumes are very often women's crops, then we find that there are these direct nutritional benefits. We're also working with a whole range of other partners. This is one where we work with Farm Radio, so at the far, there's Enter to Africa, looking at the knowledge provision, working through comics, comic providers, working through radio, delivering messages to farmers, actually collecting information back from farmers, so it helps us to understand what the farmers want, and also then training agro-dealers to be able to supply the products that farmers want. And this is a, a consortium that we call the Legume Alliance, which is working actively in Tanzania. So lots of different examples, and I'll leave it to my friends to round off. Clearly, if farmers are going to grow a crop, it really, it isn't enough, and experience has told us this, it, it isn't enough for it to contribute to soil fertility. It has to deliver something else that's useful, valuable to the farmer, to the household, you know, to, the, to, to the wider community. And generally that means it has to deliver food, um, or something that can be sold, or perhaps something that can be used as a feedstuff. So that, that multi-purpose um, nature of the legume has proved to be very important. I think food security is a key issue and entry and working particularly with women is very important to make sure that food security is, is, is achieved uh, for, the, for the African communities, particularly those who are living uh, below the poverty, poverty line. The big message I would send to this foundation is to sustain our activities, to help us uh, come from the very grassroots, uh, be able even to sustain other people who are living in difficulty. In terms of nitrogen fixation, a lot of work has been done. There is a lot of knowledge now which can, can be used even as it is now. We are going to reach large numbers of farmers. We are going to improve their lives. Um, it's very, very strategic that the, our work in nitrogen fixation and grain legumes be closely linked to other initiatives. If you think of nitrogen fixation, biological nitrogen fixation, and sustainable agriculture, well, there is no sustainable agriculture without biological nitrogen fixation. I give the last word to Tom. <laughs> so if you're interested, there's plenty more uh, material available on our website, a newsletter, lots of video material. So thanks very much.